in the forearm we have got two bones ulna and radius so in this class we are talking about different varieties of ulna fractures and the radial fractures so among the ulna fracture the two important types of fracture we are going to talk is night stick fracture and montezia fracture and regarding the radius okay there are different uh, varieties like galeji fracture dislocation then we talk about the lower end of the radius fracture which is known as colis fracture and smith fracture so let's uh, you know talk about them one after other see there now regarding the night stick fracture this is the isolated fracture of ulna without dislocation of the radial head this is the isolated fracture of ulna without dislocation of the radial head if there is fracture of ulna with dislocation of the radial head we call that montezia fracture dislocation it's a altogether a different type of fracture now what's the mechanism here this is a direct blow injury to the forearm for example somebody is attacking some another person and the person trying to protect himself or herself so they will bring their forearm okay very near uh, to the face or they want to protect themselves by blocking that you know fearful blow and during that time a fracture can occur and that is a night stick fracture that is the meaning now all the signs and symptoms you already learned before there will be pain there will be deformity there will be swelling isn't it and in very rare cases uh, sometimes there may be compartment syndrome as well compartment syndrome can develop in this type of injury regarding the treatment it's quite easy non displaced uh, night stick fracture we just put below elbow cast for 10 days followed by forearm brace for another 8 week cast okay you know the meaning of cast and brace brace is applied so that we can move the joint but once cast is applied you know the movement around the joint is not possible okay and regarding the displaced fracture you go for orif open reduction and internal fixation if there is a more than 50% shaft displacement or more than 10% angulation uh, because uh, you know um, the close reduction may not be uh, uh, satisfactory during this time that's the meaning let's move on another important type of fracture in the ulna is montezia fracture dislocation very important question from the exam point of view look at this picture first okay this picture is clearly uh, telling us what is happening here this is the upper part of the ulna bone so it is fractured and along with that see this the uh, radio ulna joint okay the proximal radio ulna joint is dislocated means head of the radius is dislocated from the joint so this is montezia fracture dislocation this is more common and has better prognosis in the pediatric age group when compared to adult so both of them can uh, have this type of fracture but pediatric age group has got better prognosis maybe the reason for that is because they have a good healing power according to the definition every student know now this is a fracture of the proximal ulna with radial head dislocation and proximal radial ulna joint injury that's why we often use the term montezia fracture dislocation regarding the mechanism of this fracture there is a direct blow on the posterior aspect of the forearm so a direct blow on the posterior aspect of the forearm hyperpronation injury we all know what is pronation and supination if there is a forceful pronation or hyperpronation then also uh, the head of the radius may come out okay and then fall on the hyperextended elbow okay fall on hyperextended elbow also similar type of injury may occur okay. let's move on now another picture which will clearly tell you see here uh, please uh, in the class okay pay attention so that uh, if this type of question or uh, picture is shown to you you can easily answer them upper part of the ulna is fractured 
along with that the radial head is dislocated montezia fracture dislocation now what are the clinical features of this fracture there is a decreased rotation of the forearm and there may be palpable lump at the radial head now one small question here for you why there is decreased rotation of the forearm anybody yes because it's between a head of a radius and ulna good okay i agree with his answer you can also answer like this the supination and pronation type of movement which are responsible for rotation of the forearm are the job of proximal and distal radio ulnar joint they are the function of radio ulnar joint and what is happening to the proximal radio ulnar joint here it is dislocated that's why there is a decreased rotation of the forearm after the head radial head is dislocated there may be a palpable lump near the radial head area another easier you know explanation for us and the ulna is angled okay the apex of the ulna is angled anteriorly and radial head is dislocated anteriorly so rarely the reverse deformity occurs so this is a type of deformity which develops in montezia fracture dislocation so there is anterior type of displacement see there there is one uh, classification which we follow in montezia fracture dislocation and this is called bedo classification according to this uh, bedo classification there are four types type 1 anterior radial head dislocation type 2 posterior radial head dislocation type 3 lateral radial head dislocation and type 4 associated fracture of the radius as well uh, which is not uh, are uh, very common in case of montezia fracture dislocation but if the injury is forceful uh, that can, a type of fracture can also occur so it is all about the radial head dislocation where the radial head is located like in type 1 anterior in type 2 posterior type 3 lateral and type 4 associated fracture of the radius as well so you can clearly see here in type 1 okay type 2 type 3 and type 4 look here the radius bone is also fractured so same classification is uh, shown here once again okay so same thing again uh, so let me skip this for you so that is a easier one isn't it so easier one for you see there type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 type 1 and radial dislocation of the radial head and fracture of ulna is already there right without fracture of ulna we cannot okay, name this as a uh, montezia fracture dislocation we cannot type 2 posterior dislocation of the radial head with fracture of ulna type 3 lateral and type 4 along with fracture of ulna we have fracture of the radius now so in orthopedics because of this uh, you know schematic diagrams and x ray the class would be very interesting as well as easier you know this is a easier field of medicine uh, according to me because of this you can clearly make a concept right now in the class type 1 see here the upper shaft of the ulna is fractured along with dislocation of the radius type 2 type 3 and type 4 even the radius bone is fractured Let's move on. Now, how we uh, do the treatment of Montezia fracture? In case of adults, okay, we go for open reduction and internal fixation of ulna with indirect radius reduction in ninety percent of the patient. So once you go for the orif of ulna, okay, radius bone or the head of the radius would be reduced. on its own that is the meaning a splint and early post operative range of motion if elbow is completely stable otherwise immobilization in plaster with elbow flex for 6 week so this is uh, the process of immobilization because immobilization is a very important step 
in the healing of the fracture. Now, one small point from the you know exam point of view for you. Sometimes the question may may be asked like this: What is the most important step in fracture healing? They may ask uh, or uh, give different options for you, like reduction of the fracture, isn't it? Immobilization of the fracture, and something else. Always choose immobilization as the correct answer. Immobilization is the most important step in fracture healing because it is true for both uh, reduce as well as uh, you know displaced type of fracture. In pediatric age group, attempt the close reduction and immobilization in plaster with elbow flexed for bedo type one to type three, and surgery is done for type four because both bones are fractured in bedo type four, uh, you know Montezia fracture dislocation. So better to go for surgery. Otherwise, uh, uh, close reduction and immobilization would be enough in case of pediatric age group. Now, what are the specific complications of Montezia fracture dislocation? Remember that uh, big class which I took, uh, you know, uh, a little while earlier. Uh, different fractures complications. So very very important class for you. Okay. Now, these are the specific complication. What is the full form of this PIN? Anybody? Who can answer this to me? This is a branch of one of the nerve there. I'm giving clue to you. What is the what is the full name now? Posterior uh, interosseous Posterior interosseous Excellent. Posterior interosseous nerve. Posterior interosseous nerve. And do you know this nerve is the branch of which big nerve? Radial nerve. Radial nerve, sir. Excellent. This is a branch of radial nerve. Very good. So posterior interosseous nerve is the most common nerve which is injured in Montezia fracture dislocation. Okay. And most of this injury is neuropraxia. Neuropraxia, so it will get resolved spontaneously most of the time. In the last class, I talked about this. There are three important types of nerve injury: neuropraxia, axonotomesis, and neurotomesis. Axonotomesis and neurotomesis are a bit severe type of nerve injury. Neuropraxia is the uh, you know the most milder one. Okay, that's the meaning. Radial head instability and redislocation in the future. And radio ulnar synostosis is another complication. There is a permanent fusion of the radius and ulna bone, and that is not a good thing thing to have because we will lose the rotation function of the forearm if that happens. Now, all of you, please look at this slide. Okay, uh, take a moment of time here. Now see here. So let me explain. Okay, that will be uh, better for you. You see there in this case. So this is a preoperative radiograph of forearm, and this is showing Montezia fracture dislocation. And according to the Bedo classification, is type three. It's type three. In type three, the radial head is dislocated laterally. Okay, laterally. Along with that, there is a Salter Harris type two fracture of the distal radius. Now, I have not taught you about the Salter Harris, uh, you know, fracture classification. This classification is used for epiphysis fracture. Okay, epiphysis fracture. So, in some other respective classes, we'll talk about this. Now, see this. This is the post-operative radiograph showing the proximal ulna fracture fixed with plate and distal radius fracture fixed with two K wire. So here, these are the K wire, and here is the plate. So this is open reduction and internal fixation. And this is, uh, you know, up the clinical radiograph or photograph of a child seven weeks postoperatively, showing the well healed wounds and good range of motion at the elbow. So this is a very good type of management. Now with this, okay, 
let's enter into the radius fracture now, see there one of the important radius fracture which we are going to talk in today's class is Galagi fracture dislocation okay so let's talk about it see this this is also one of the example of radial diaphysis fracture because diaphysis means shaft of the radius fracture of the proximal two third can be considered truly isolated and there may be Galagi fracture dislocation which refers to fracture of the radius with disruption of the distal radius ulnar joint so let me underline this for you and at the end of this class these are the points you should remember okay these are the questions which are asked in the exam what is the differentiation between montagia fracture and galagi fracture see here this is a fracture of the radius with disruption of the distal radial ulnar joint now what's the mechanism here it is usually caused by a direct or indirect trauma such as fall onto outstretched hand this fall onto outstretched hand is a very common mechanism of injury in the upper upper limb so many different types of fracture occur because of this injury and it may also result from direct trauma to the wrist typically on the dorsolateral aspect or fall onto outstretched hand with pronation okay outstretched hand with pronation that can also result in uh, a disruption of the distal radial nerve joint with fracture of the radius now this galagi fracture usually have fracture of the distal shaft of the radius okay distal shaft let's move on now see there please pay attention why it is uh, known as a galagi fracture see this there is a fracture of the radius and there is dislocation of the distal radio ulnar joint so galagi fracture dislocation and this is the x-ray uh, see carefully this is the radius bone this is the radius bone now sometimes students are confused if this type of picture is shown which is radius and which is ulna so what is the clue here which bone is radius the lower end of the radius is wider than the lower end of the ulna never forget this okay see this the lower end of the radius is wider than the lower end of the ulna whereas upper end of the ulna is wider than upper end of the radius now i cannot see the upper end of the ulna and the radius here in this x-ray but we can see in this schematic diagram see this the radial head the circumference is smaller than the ulnar head okay or upper end of the ulna we say so this is a, a practical information for you and you will never forget it now so galagi fracture is fracture of the distal radial shaft with disruption of the distal radio ulnar joint this is the short form we have written here distal radio ulnar joint you can clearly see in this picture the shaft of the radius is fractured with the dislocation of distal radio ulna joint it most commonly occur in the distal one third of the radius near the junction of metaphysis and diaphysis what is metaphysis yes what is metaphysis junction between epiphysis and diaphysis the area between the epiphysis and diaphysis Diaphysis. Excellent. Okay, very easy question at this time because you have already done extensively. Metaphysis is the area between diaphysis and epiphysis, and this is the active, you know, a growth area of the bone. Active growth area of the bone. There is a epiphyseal plate of cartilage between epiphysis and metaphysis. Okay, and this together, along with metaphysis. Uh, and this uh, epiphyseal plate of cartilage is the growth area of the bone so that area is uh, uh, fractured in case of galagi fracture dislocation it is three times more common than montagia fracture dislocation in the clinical practice so you you understand now this type of questions are very commonly asked in the exam so what is the mechanism the common mechanism push type of injury means fall on outstretched hand this is the short form fall on outstretched hand 
with axial loading of pronated forearm. The person, you know, supported the whole body with a pronated forearm when the person fall on the ground. During that time, Galley's fracture dislocation can occur very commonly. Let's move on. Now, the investigation we do is X-ray. And X-ray will confirm the diagnosis. So what are the important points here? There may be shortening of the distal radius by more than five millimeter relative to the distal ulna because of the displacement, isn't it? Because of the displacement, the radius may be shorter. There is widening of the distal radio ulnar joint space on anterior posterior view of the X-ray. That's how we know a distal radio ulnar joint is dislocated. Look at this here. Though it is not an X-ray, this is a schematic diagram, but very good one. There is a gap. There is a undue gap we can see. So uh, this is dislocated now. And dislocation of radius with respect to ulna and true lateral flame. which you very clearly see. So always we can uh, we have to take the two flames, AP and lateral, and that can give us the diagnosis. Now one important point I like to highlight here again though it is uh, told so many times in the previous classes, when we uh, take the X-ray in a fracture case, always include the joint above and below the fracture site. Otherwise, you can easily miss this type of dislocation. Now look at this and tell me, what is the diagnosis here? See there, please, all of you. Galagy fracture. Galagy fracture. What about dislocation? Is the distal radio ulna joint dislocated or not? Just see that. It's yes, dislocated. Very it's good. Right. Excellent. It is dislocated. Okay. It's a very, very clear, obvious x ray. Look at this gap here. It is dislocated. And the radius bone is fractured. It is not ulna which is fractured. You can you have to see it very clearly. Just stress this small bone. This is the lower end of the ulna. I cannot see any fracture line here. But see this. This is the distal end of the radius. See here, there is acute angulation, and I can see the fracture line also here. So this is how you need to judge. Okay, it is very easy here as well. This is the lateral plane. This is the AP. See this, there's a dislocation, okay? And there is a fracture. Galagy fracture dislocation. Now, what is the treatment of uh, this Galagy fracture? Open reduction and internal fixation of the radius is done usually. Open reduction and internal fixation is done of the radius fracture. And afterward, you assess the stability of distal radial ulna joint by balloting the distal ulna relative to the distal radius. That means by moving it. And usually uh, what uh, you know we have seen here is once you uh, reduce the fracture, once you treat the fracture, the, the dislocated or the dislocated joint will come back to its normal position on its own until and unless there is severe disruption at that site. So what is the meaning here? Just focus on the management of the fracture. Dislocation will be sorted out on its own. That's the meaning. So if distal radial large joint is stable and reducible, splint for 10 to 14 days with early range of motion encouraged. And if it is unstable, do ORIF or go for percutaneous pinning with long arm cast in supination for six weeks. Either go for open reduction and internal fixation, or you don't need to open that fracture site. You can put percutaneous pinning with long arm cast, okay, for six weeks. So this is the treatment of Galagy fracture dislocation. Now we have studied these two important types of fracture, Montesia and Galagy. So before I move further, Okay, let's utilize a bit of time to differentiate these two fractures once again. Because these are, trust me, 
a very very common question in the orthopedic exam okay so see there please all of you please focus on your screen okay let's uh, you know give a few minutes here So this is a, uh, isn't it? Montezia fracture dislocation. On other side, we have Galizzi fracture dislocation. Look at the person who described it for the first time. Giovanni Battista Montezia is the person who gave uh, this nomenclature of Montezia fracture dislocation. And on the other hand, it's Ricardo Galizzi who described Galizzi fracture dislocation. Okay. So the definition everybody know now. Montezia is the fracture, fracture of upper shaft of the ulna with dislocation of the radial head, or you can also say dislocation of proximal radio ulna joint. On the other hand, it is a fracture of the distal shaft of the radius, okay, with dislocation of distal radio ulna joint. Never forget that. Now, how to remember? Isn't it? Sometimes it is quite confusing if suddenly this type of question comes in your viva exam. Montesia okay the m is there and ulna is the medial bone that's how i remember all the time when i was a student i used to remember like that montesia m it starts with m and ulna is the medial bone so it is all about the fracture of the ulna if i remember that okay then other things are quite easy because upper shaft of the ulna is very near to the proximal radio ulna joint and distal shaft of the radius is near to the distal radio ulna joint i can always uh, correlate the things like that this is the way to remember otherwise you know uh, in the beginning when you are just about to study these things it's quite confusing but once you remember like that you can easily uh, give the answer other things are uh, quite easy for you you can uh, uh, go through this on your own okay let's move on now after doing this let's move on to the distal radius fracture there are two important types of fracture we are going to talk here and they are coley's fracture and smith fracture coley's and smith now right now okay in this slide you have to know the differences between these two just look here and tell me what differences you found here yes coley's fracture is looking out, outward and smith's fracture is looking inward fine isn't it absolutely right or you can also describe it in other way in a coley's fracture okay, the displacement is dorsal okay it is called dorsal displacement now dorsal and ventral, every student know the meaning. These are anatomical terms, and we know it by now. So Coley's fracture is the dorsal displacement or dorsal tilting, and Smith fracture is the ventral displacement or ventral tilting. If you just remember that much, it is very easy understanding for you. Okay, so let's move on. Look at this uh, X-ray. Okay, please pay attention here and tell me. Is this Coley's fracture or Smith fracture? See that? Or both? Both. Now, why? Which one? Which one? Like, let me show you. Okay, then you, you answer. Let me let me show you. This one is Coley's fracture or Smith fracture? The first one. This one is Smith fracture. Mm -hmm. This fracture. This fracture. And this is? Coley's fracture. Coley's fracture. Are you sure? Any other? Both structure? of them are. Both of them are Coley's. So another answer I'm getting. Now one more, one more student, please. You can try whoever. Okay, this is the open question. And one more student to answer this by looking it very carefully. The first one is looking like Coley's yeah. fracture. Good. And the second one? 
still colleagues are smith yes, smith that both are colleagues hey, fracture sir both are colleagues both are colleagues fracture okay now see both that very good okay so, so see that this i just i just want to check whether you are you know actively participating in this class or not so we we cannot see what you are doing there isn't it but please okay these all classes are for you guys so whenever you 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 know come to take these classes pay attention okay you learn a lot trust me you learn a lot in orthopedics because all these x rays all these pictures will make you understand in a very easy way now just now what i told you just look at the distal fragment we always uh, you know uh, classify the displacement according to where is the distal fragment going this is small piece is the distal fragment see here and most probably this is the dorsal aspect of the hand and this curved area is the ventral aspect so this fragment is going dorsally so this is a colis fracture definitely colis fracture and another one it is the same type of thing here this is a palmar aspect this is the dorsal aspect so this uh, displaced fragment is again moving dorsally so both of these are colis fracture we we will know how smith fracture looks we have collected different x ray okay can see that later on very good so right in the beginning if you know this uh, then the class would be easier now regarding the epidemiology of distal radius fracture these are the very common fractures of the upper extremity absolutely common especially in older people and the reason for this fracture to occur in the older people is their bone is relatively weaker probably as a result of osteoporosis remember that area is already weak anatomically because it is a junction between the cortical bone and cancellous bone on top of that if a person is having osteoporosis as a result of age then the chances would be higher it usually occur as a result of direct trauma or fall on out stretched hand regarding the mechanism of injury one of the important mechanism is fall on out stretched hand again we call it f o o s h injury with the wrist in dorsiflexion let me underline that because it's a very important term wrist is in dorsiflexion and the person fall on an out stretched hand okay and then distal radius fracture can occur usually the colis one high energy injury may result in significantly displaced highly unstable fractures like rotor cuff accident okay uh, like a fall from the height then probably some bullet injuries or something like that now look at this picture very carefully this is a picture of distal radius fracture okay and uh, uh, this is a colis fracture now why it is a colis fracture by looking at this you know picture every student must be able to tell look at the typical deformity of colis fracture this is because of the dorsal displacement of the fracture the distal fragment is displaced dorsally as a result of this this typical deformity is known as dinner fork deformity or bayonet like deformity or displacement see this look at this this is called a bayonet isn't it it's uh, present in the you know a firearm or, you know or gun so a severe colis fracture may look like this so this type of questions can be asked in the exam in the mcq exam now regarding the clinical evaluation of distal radius fracture there is a gross deformity of the wrist one of the deformity you have just seen there dinner fork deformity the wrist is swollen and there is a painful range of motion the person feels a lot of pain when we try to move the wrist at the same time examine the apsilateral shoulder and elbow now why why we examine the the apsilateral shoulder and elbow joint of the patient yes you can answer this based on the same 
Okay, good. Anybody else? Now you can answer this easy question in a different way. One, remember, fall on outstretched hand is the common mechanism of so many different fracture. Fracture clavicle is one of them. Fracture upper shaft of the humerus is another one. Supracondylar fracture is another one. Fracture of the forearm as well as fracture of the wrist. All of these, a single mechanism may be responsible that is fall on outstretched hand. In different types of position, maybe pronation, maybe supination, maybe you know, your dorsiflexion, maybe palmar flexion, isn't it? Something like that. So because of that single reason, you should always examine other joints and nearer bone. That is one important reason. Another one, if there is a severe type of injury, for example, road traffic accident, motor vehicle accident or collision, multiple bones may be fractured. So I have to examine, okay, not only the ipsilateral shoulder at that time, the whole body. Re regarding the neurovascular examination, you have to specifically examine the median nerve for acute carpal tunnel syndrome. Because median nerve is very near to the wrist. It is present on the ventral aspect of the wrist and carpal tunnel syndrome can occur as a result of compression. What are the different types of X-ray we take to evaluate these fractures? See there. Now, like any other fracture, we have a two special you know, view, AP view and lateral view. But in case of wrist, we can take the third type of view that is called oblique view, okay? Now, uh, we have to see the different types of angles and different types of inclination there. And to see these angles and inclination for the uh, you know, uh, description of the displacement, we have to take this different view. So there is a radial, radial inclination of 23 degrees. We will comp uh, compare with the horizontal. So please mute yourself. And then there is a radial height of 11 millimeter, okay? From the, you know, if I draw a straight line from the ulna, then the radial styloid process is a bit higher, about 11 millimeter high. And uh, in case of a fracture of the distal radius, it may change, you know? So that's why these X-rays are quite important for us. And this is known as volar tilt. This normal volar tilt of the radius is 11 degree. Now volar, means towards the palm of our hand is called volar and towards the you know the superficial part of the palm the other aspect of the palm also known as the dorsal surface of the palm is called dorsal surface dorsal and volar so don't get confused this may be a relatively new term for you this means towards the palm it is facing the palm that is the meaning let's move on now Let's talk about the different name, this different eponym, which uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, learned before, isn't it? The eponym we say, now see that? Police fracture and Smith fracture, by this time every student know. Police fracture is the combination of intra and extra articular fracture of the distal radius with dorsal angulation, dorsal displacement, radial shift, and radial shortening. So one of the important points you need to note here is the typical displacement and angulation of Coley's fracture. There's no doubt it is the fracture of the distal radius, but what type of displacement, what type of angulation, and what type of shift? It is dorsal, okay, angulation, dorsal displacement, radial shift. And because of the fracture of the radial bone, there may be shortening of the radius as well. This is the most common okay, type of distal radius fracture, which is caused by fall on outstretched hand. Now, whenever we fall, okay, and we 
we tend to you know uh, bear our weight on the outstretched hand and during that time we like to put the hand in a palmar aspect means with our palm we land on the floor this is a very typical you know mechanism for colis fracture there are so many other fracture which which occur by this mechanism i already told you before the break now what about smith fracture which is opposite of the colis or reverse colis we say it is fracture of the distal radius with volar angulation from a fall on a flex wrist now so volar angulation means it is angulated towards the palm okay towards the palmar aspect and how the fracture occurs now opposite mechanism of colis that is from a fall on a flex wrist now the person landed on the flex wrist on that side then the displacement will go towards the palmar aspect this is smith fracture exactly opposite of the colis you can remember like that some other eponyms are also there okay like barton fracture and chauffer fracture barton and chauffer we have uh, you know learned this before but that was a bit of difficult type of topic for you isn't it so many different names were there okay so let's uh, choose some of the important name which comes in fracture of the distal radius right. now barton fracture is an intra articular fracture of the distal radius with dislocation of the radio carpal joint so this is a intra articular fracture because there is a wrist joint intra articular means inside the capsule of the wrist joint and along with that there is a dislocation of the radio carpal joint that is barton fracture there are two types dorsal and palmar according to the displacement the chauffer fracture means the radial styloid process is fractured the styloid process is one of the part of the distal uh, you know end of the radius okay so it is fractured there that's the meaning wait let me mute this guy okay now mechanism of the injury is compression of the scaphoid process against the radial styloid process scaphoid bone i should say scaphoid bone is uh, which which type of bone where is it present anybody where is scaphoid bone present carpal carpal bone carpal, carpal, carpal bone, bone. excellent it's excellent this is a type of carpal bone a very important type of carpal bone which we are going to talk after we finish distal radius fracture because scaphoid fracture is a common question which comes in an exam so when the radial styloid process is compressed against the scaphoid bone then chauffer fracture can occur just the name you know now what is the treatment of colis fracture Let's talk about it. This is one of the commonest fracture you already know. So treatment also should be uh, well known to the doctors. Our goal of the treatment is to restore radial height and radial inclination as well as volar tilt. As far as possible, it should be normal. It should be normal. Now see this. Okay, uh, the same picture we have uh, you know taken again. See this. this is the radial inclination of around 22 degree this is the height of the radial styloid process about 11 mm and this is called volar tilt of around 10 to 11 degree of the radius so it has to be maintained when we treat the fracture otherwise there is restriction in the joint that is the wrist joint movement Let's move on. Now, with this in the back of the mind, uh, let's uh, talk about the treatment part now. Close reduction is very commonly done in colis fracture, fracture treatment. Close reduction is commonly done. Now, how we do that? Hematoma block is given first, and this is a one of the uh, you know common way of treating fracture. Hematoma block means you give local anesthetic. in the fracture site okay that is called hematoma block and it is quite a useful type of analgesia so we give lignocaine there directly into the fracture site wait for few minutes and then there will be no pain when we do the procedure 
This is also known as consolidation. After that, we reduce the fracture. This is called close reduction. And during that time, uh, you give a constant traction with extension, or you exaggerate the injury in other means. Traction with ulnar deviation, pronation, flexion is given. So this is better, you know, uh, done than the explained. And with a, a lot of experience, we can easily reduce these type of fractures. After the reduction, put the dorsal slab or below elbow cast for five to six week. Okay. So around five to six week, we have to put the patient on the on the cast here. Okay, for five to six week, dorsal slab or below elbow cast. Now, what's the difference between slab and cast? I'm sure student know this, but still I want to hear, hear the answer, yes? What's the difference between slab and cast? Anybody? Sir, during cast, there will be no mobilization of the joint. Okay, then, then what is the slab? Sir, during slab, uh, slightly movement can be done because it is only apply on the posterior side. You're absolutely right. Okay. Now let me repeat again for the sake of other students. Slab is only put on one side. It is not all around the circumference. Slab usually is put posteriorly. Is right. But cast is all around. You know, we wrap. We wrap that plaster of Paris everywhere. That is cast. And when we put the cast, the movement of the joint is a problem. Even in the slab, you know, sometimes we, we put that joint in a particular angle. The movement is not that very possible, but cast, it will be definitely difficult. There is another, uh, you know, type of immobilization. We call it brace. That brace means now joint is, uh, you know, kept free and you, the person can move the joint a little bit uh, if we put the brace or the person can, you know, do the function of that joint. So these are very important orthopedic terms, slab, cast, and brace. That's what I'm explaining now. Now, after this, what we do? See there. Okay. We took x-ray okay, after one week. And every week, we take for three weeks. Every week, x-ray should be taken for around three weeks. And just check whether the, the fracture is healing or not, and whether uh, there is any more displacement occurring after you have done reduction or not. Okay, this is important point. After you reduce, the first x-ray should be taken immediately just to make sure whether the reduction is satisfactory or not. And if it is not satisfactory, you need to repeat the reduction again. You need to repeat the same thing. And if still it is not satisfactory, you need to consider open the reduction and internal fixation, or you can consider the external fixation as well. But ORIF is uh, commonly done than external fixation in this type of situation. So this is the treatment of Collis fracture. So what is the take home messages from here? ORIF is not commonly done in case of Collis fracture. Usually we go for close reduction and then the plaster. Let's move on. Now, all of you, please pay attention here. What can you see in this picture, in this X-ray? See that, please? Now, look at this uh, first X-ray carefully. What is the diagnosis first? Tell me the diagnosis first. Looking. Gilesi. Uh, Frictionistic. So is displacement of a nerve. Displacement of radio ulnar joint. And 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 this head of the head of the radius. Head of the radius displaced. Okay. Now see here. Somebody is telling me about galaxy fracture dislocation here. I I know. Where is the mistake here? Okay, and the it is not very you know abnormal or very unusual type of answer. Yes, there is a point why the student is answering like that. It looks like the distal radial nerve joint is displaced 
Yeah, there is a good gap there. But this gap is because of displacement of the distal fragment of the radius. Now see here, where this distal fragment is going here. See this? It is going towards the radial side. It is going towards the radial side. This is called radial displacement. This is an AP view. And, you know, to, to call it galaxy, the fracture in the distal radius should be a little bit higher somewhere here. It should be the fracture of the shaft of the radius. This is fracture of the junction of epiphysis and diaphysial area of the radius. So this is Cooley's fracture. This is not Galaxy fracture. This is Cooley's fracture. Now see this, where is the displacement? If I see the lateral view, it is clearly going dorsally, clearly dorsally. So dorsal displacement with a radial shifting, clear cut case of Cooley's fracture. And this is a good observation, okay? I'm not uh, criticizing you for this observation. There is a good gap, okay? And this gap is present here because of shifting of the distal part of the radius, okay? Now see there, what type of treatment they have done? This is called ORIF, open reduction and internal fixation. You can simply say that. So there is a plate with the screws, plate with the screw. This is an excellent way of treating. Let's move on. Now, on the other hand, what is Smith fracture then? So let's try to differentiate these two. Smith fracture is also the fracture of distal end of the radius, but the displacement in this type of fracture is a volar displacement. So volar means towards the palm, okay? Towards the palm or towards the ventral aspect. It is also known as reverse of the Cooley's fracture. Mechanism for a Smith fracture is fall onto the back of the flex hand. The mechanism is also opposite. In Cooley's fracture, the person falls on the outstretched hand when they land on the palm. Okay, the palm is facing the, the ground. But in a Smith fracture, the palm, sorry, the wrist is flexed and they fall on the back of the flex hand. So exactly opposite. Regarding the treatment, this is usually an unstable type of fracture and needs open reduction and internal fixation. Close reduction is not uh, commonly done, but I'm not saying we, we even cannot try for this. Of course, uh, the, the orthopedic surgeon can try for close reduction with a hematoma block, but if there is a, a not satisfactory reduction or if the reduction um, is difficult, then definitely the surgeon will go for open reduction and internal fixation. And after that, long arm cast is put in a supination position for six weeks. Long arm cast means it should be started from the mid arm, mid arm, okay, it's upper arm, and then it should be kept up to the hand. Now, with this, let's move on to the uh, hand. And in the hand, one of the important type of fracture we are going to talk is a scaphoid fracture, okay? A scaphoid fracture. And some other minor types of fracture are also there. We'll talk quickly about that. Now, all of you, please focus on this, uh, you know, slide first, okay? There are some important points highlighted here. So first of all, what are the bones? Those are present on the hand. See this, these are called carpal bones carpal bones, there are eight in number, okay? Carpal bones, eight in number. These are called, which bones are they? Which I'm showing with my pointer, which bones are these? Metacarpal. Metacarpal. Metacarpal, metacarpal. metacarpal bones. Very good. And then pilings. Very good, metacarpal bones. Then which are these bones now, which I'm showing? Phalanges. Yes. Phalanges. Phalanges, Pro proximal phalanges. Exactly. Proximal distal, middle bone. Exactly. Proximal, middle, and the distal. Excellent answer. Proximal, middle, and the distal. And see that in thumb, we have only two phalanges. Okay, only two in the thumb. In other finger, we have got three. We have got three. So these are the different one. And every student know how to name this joint. 
okay this this is a very important anatomical knowledge these are called intercarpal joint the joints between the carpal bone intercarpal joint joint between carpal and metacarpal is called carpo metacarpal joint carpo metacarpal joint you, you you have to give a specific name because all these carpal bones have got different name okay now this is very important joint these are called knuckles knuckles these are called metacarpo phalangeal joint metacarpo phalangeal joint and these are proximal interphalangeal joint and distal interphalangeal joint pip and dip which is like that okay so fracture can occur in a different uh, you know areas here let's move on now this this is a uh, you know another pure anatomical you know picture which is uh, you know uh, showing the names of these different bones okay let's uh, spend a bit of time here all of you please focus there please now these are the names of the eight carpal bones scaphoid lunate triquetral or triquetrum and pisiform trapezium trapezoid capitate and hamet okay during your uh, you know medical uh, classes one very famous mnemonic i'm sure the teacher must have taught you anybody know that mnemonic here how to remember the name of these carpal bones anyone she look too she, she look too pretty try to catch her excellent she looks too pretty try to catch her very good okay this is the way we all have learned in our medical school and you are also learning the same way she looks too pretty try to catch her now if you miss the row there then it will be completely wrong okay don't try to miss the row So I'll teach you how to do that. Now see this. This S stands for scaphoid. So we are starting from the proximal row and going distally. This is the proximal row. This is the distal row, right? So S is scaphoid. L is lunate. Look at this number seven, lunate. T is for triquetral, and P for pisiform. So she looks too pretty. We have covered all these proximal row of the carpal bone. Let's go to the distal one now. Trapezium. This T for trapezium. Another T for trapezoid. Catch. This C is for capitate, and S for hamet. So this is an excellent way to remember the name of these carpal bones, and according to the row as well. Now these are the metacarpal. First, second, third, fourth, and fifth. We have got five metacarpal bones. Then the phalanges. Okay, proximal, middle, distal, and in the thumb we only have two. now with this background knowledge let's talk about scaphoid fracture very important type of fracture and from the exam point of view and from the clinical point of view also a lot of questions are asked from here now why this is important fracture so let me explain right in the beginning when somebody is suffering from trauma okay in the beginning you know scaphoid fracture is very difficult to diagnose they just have a bit of pain there and when we press on that anatomical snuff box area then the person will feel the pain the person can move that area with pain definitely but the person can still move it and in the beginning if you take x ray the x ray also will be negative means it will be normal the fracture line is not seen in the x ray if you take that x ray quickly after the injury but if we repeat the x ray after one week or after 10 days then the fracture line would be visible that's why square fight fractures are often went unnoticed in the beginning so what is the take home message is from uh, from this uh, discussion if somebody is having tenderness or pain in anatomical snuff box after a certain injury 
think about scuffed fracture go for the treatment don't delay the treatment go for the treatment take x ray again after 10 days and then if the fracture line is seen you are almost certain yes this is a scuffed fracture i am dealing with okay let's move on now regarding the epidemiology of scuffed fracture it is common in young men not common in children or in patients beyond the middle age so this is a fracture of the young person most common carpal bone to fractured out of eight this is the most common one and it may be associated with other carpal or wrist injury like colis fracture as well because the mechanism of fracture is similar and the most important mechanism is again fall on outstretched hand fall on outstretched hand the same mechanism is responsible for so many other fractures that's why we have to look for other fracture also what is the you know what is happening in this fall fall and outstretched hand mechanism regarding the scaphoid fracture see that there is an impaction of scaphoid on distal radius result in transverse fracture through the west of the scaphoid bone in 65% of the time distal part of the scaphoid in 10% and proximal part of the scaphoid in 25% one of the very very important point here if the west of the scaphoid is fractured then okay then the proximal part of the scaphoid bone will not receive any blood supply because it is commonly getting blood supply from the distal part that blood vessel is also damaged during the fracture so a vascular necrosis of scaphoid is very common to occur in this type of fracture so because of these different points you know this fracture is very common question in the exam now see there so what are the clinical features of scaphoid fracture now is talk about it there is pain with wrist movement pain with wrist movement there is tenderness in the anatomical snuff box everybody know what is that anatomical snuff box isn't it that is a, a bit of depressed area uh, you know on the dorsal uh, surface of the thumb okay relatively on the dorsal surface of the palm towards the you know aspect of thumb uh, there is a depressed area when we extend our thumb and adduct our thumb abduct i should say this is anatomical snuff box now what is the content of that anatomical snuff box anybody what is present there which 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 radial structure artery. excellent that is radial artery very good answer radial artery is present in the anatomical snuff box okay just remember that much now when we compress over that anatomical snuff box there is tenderness in case of scaphoid fracture and usually it is a non displaced type of fracture because it's a flat type of bone okay flatter type of bone now one very important point here tender anatomical snuff box has 100% sensitivity for the diagnosis of scaphoid fracture but 29% specificity because other injuries of the radial aspect or injuries of the wrist can also have tenderness there now you all, you all know the meaning of sensitivity and specificity because you are also studying the community medicine at the same time sensitivity okay is the chance of detecting true positive cases and specificity means chance of detecting true negative cases okay to make it very simplified that is the meaning now i already talked about this the proximal pole of the scaphoid receives as much as 100% of its arterial blood supply from the radial artery that enters at the distal pole or distal fragment as a result of this if there is a fracture through the west of the scaphoid right in the middle part or a little bit towards the proximal it disrupts the blood supply which results in high chance of a vascular necrosis avn is the short form for a vascular necrosis and another is non union if there is no blood supply you know the fracture will never heal so this is called non union 
what investigation we like to do in in the diagnosis of square foot fracture now see there the typical investigation is x ray in the pa view lateral view and the scaphoid view this scaphoid view is checking the x ray with extension of the wrist and ulnar deviation okay after 2 weeks we need to take this x ray now why after 2 weeks isn't it that question should come in your mind why because in the beginning the x ray uh, the fracture line is not seen in the x ray after certain time around 10 10 days till 2 weeks time the fracture line is radiologically visible because there is a resorption of small amount of bone there from the fracture site that's why the fracture site will be evident this is highly typical of this of this fracture never forget it many of the you know doctor many of the or even orthopedic surgeon they miss this scaphoid fracture in the beginning but if you remember this important point you will not miss it if we go for ct scan or mri or bone scan then fracture can be diagnosed quite early okay fracture can be diagnosed quite early and uh, sometimes even after 10 days to 2 week if x ray is negative you can order ct scan there now these are the different radiograph ap and lateral ap view of the scaphoid with a hand in ulnar deviation and 45 degree pronation view just to see that fractured line okay there's nothing else for doing this type of x ray now please focus on these uh, this uh, you know x ray it is already shown there with the arrow okay you can clearly see that so that is the fracture of scaphoid see here now just look there very carefully and tell me where is the fracture here which part of the scaphoid is having fracture is it uh, proximal uh, is it distal or is it exactly in the west or the middle part of the scaphoid yes where slightly it, it, the west area sir west area Mid middle area sir looking yes. middle area exactly it looks like it is in the middle area you are right now uh, Uh, anatomical term should be very clear proximal means towards the radius okay this is always proximal see there towards this side is proximal towards the finger or phalanges is the distal so it is the middle one here so it is a high high chance of uh, high chance of ischemia of this proximal part this part has a high chance of ischemia and later on it may develop avascular necrosis and once it develops that the fracture is not going to heal easily now let's talk about the treatment early treatment is critical for improving the outcome because there is a chance of avascular necrosis if the treatment is done late in the non displaced fracture usually this fracture is not displaced you know in non displaced that is less than 1 mm displacement or less than 15 degree angulation you can use a long arm thumb spica cast for four week then after that it we change into the short arm cast until the radiographic evidence of healing is seen and that takes a long time around 2 to 3 month so this is a difficult fracture to treat again the simple reason for this is relative you know ischemia of that important area this thumb spica is a type of cast okay which is uh, you know uh, reaching up to the thumb from below elbow region now displaced uh, uh, to cases of scaphoid fracture we go for orif open reduction and internal fixation and compression screws are mainly used there like you can clearly see here. these are the compression screw but even percutaneous k wire can be used and uh, Uh, for the percutaneous k wire you don't need to open the fracture site okay under radiological guidance you can uh, easily put the k wire from the skin now look look here this is called scaphoid cast okay scaphoid cast look at the thumb thumb is completely covered okay 
and uh, it has uh, reached up to the uh, just below the elbow or a bit a bit upper side of the mid forearm so this is called uh, scaphoid cast and this gives a very good immobilization to the scaphoid bone so that it can heal in time look at this uh, x-ray okay. this is open reduction and internal fixation of the scaphoid fracture see this here is a scaphoid fracture and they have fixed it with the herbert screw this is a type of a screw which is also known as a compression screw it is quite commonly used in the treatment of this type of fracture you can clearly see the fracture line right in the middle of the scaphoid okay and this has uh, uh, you know treated the fracture quite well so this is a picture of herbert's compression screw okay this will bring both pieces together and there is a good chance of healing in time let's talk about some of the specific complication of scaphoid fracture so many students know it already a vascular necrosis of the proximal fragment is probably the most important complication of scaphoid fracture and because of this there is non union or mal union non union is more common and we have discussed this topic before if non union is there then you need to take bone graft okay and try for the treatment again and the common site for bone graft is from iliac crest okay iliac crest delayed union is also a common feature again because of ischemia and this delayed union uh, is treated by surgical fixation that is open reduction and internal fixation usually herbert screw is used here regarding the prognosis of scaphoid fracture fracture of the proximal third of the scaphoid have 70% rate of non union or avascular necrosis so this is not a good data for us okay so what is the lesson to be learned quick diagnosis and prompt treatment can still prevent this type of complication quick treatment and prompt quick uh, you know diagnosis and prompt treatment okay west fracture have healing rate of 80 to 90% and distal third fracture have healing rate close to 100% so it's all about the damage of the blood supply of the proximal one third or proximal part of the scaphoid bone now once the blood vessels uh, are you know ruptured or damaged well we cannot do much okay but still you know if if uh, the treatment is in time probably who knows the blood vessels have not completely ruptured or damaged still we can save the function we can still heal the fracture in time that is the meaning what is the finding in this x-ray you can clearly see there is a fracture line and this fracture line is present at the base of first metacarpal bone okay this is the base of first metacarpal bone and we can see a fracture line with a relative gap between the trapezium and the first metacarpal bone so we believe there is a dislocation also this is known as bennett fracture dislocation okay bennett fracture dislocation I see there so bennett fracture dislocation is the fracture of uh, base of the first metacarpal bone along with dislocation another one you can clearly see here look at this there is a fracture line i can see okay and there is a displacement also and along with that uh, this is a schematic diagram which is showing the same thing at that site there is a fracture is called bennett fracture dislocation and the important muscles which are you know associated with the displacement of this fracture is abductor pollicis longus as well as adductor pollicis it is uh, better explained by this picture so uh, please uh, pay attention here see this this is muscle m stands for muscle here okay abductor pollicis longus tendon extensor pollicis brevis tendon and extensor carpi radialis longus tendon and extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon now let's focus 
on the metacarpal bone, the first metacarpal bone, right here. This is the area. Now, in this area, see which tendon is attached. Abductor pollicis longus. It is attached right there. So, this muscle or this tendon is particularly okay, associated with the displacement of Bennett fracture and dislocation. Let's uh, come to the slide now. This is an intra-articular fracture or dislocation of base of first metacarpal bone. Okay. See this? So intra-articular fracture or dislocation of base of first metacarpal where there is a small fragment still attaching with the trapezium bone. Trapezium is a carpal bone which is present there. And the joint is formed between trapezium and the base of the first metacarpal. So this is the meaning of intra-articular fracture. Because of the action of this abductor pollicis longus tendon, there is a lateral retraction of the first metacarpal shaft. And adductor pollicis is also playing a role there. Adductor pollicis. Can anybody tell me adductor pollicis is a muscle of which compartment adductor pollicis? Anybody? Let's check okay, whether you are revising your anatomy or not. Adductor pollicis, it belongs to which compartment? Where is this muscle present? Flexor compartment. Yes, yes. Please say it again. I didn't list here properly. Flexor compartment. Now, this abductor pollicis longus is a flexor compartment muscle. There's no doubt. Abductor pollicis longus. Okay, but adductor pollicis belongs to thinner group of muscle. Thinner, thinner eminence and hypothenar eminence, isn't it? You know that. So adductor pollicis belongs to thinner eminence, but it is supplied by ulnar nerve. So this is an exception. Adductor pollicis is supplied by ulnar nerve. All other thinner muscles are supplied by median nerve. Now, regarding the treatment of this Bennett fracture uh, dislocation, we have to go for close reduction and cast immobilization. And close reduction is done for non-displaced fracture. Okay. If the fracture is displaced, then probably we have to go for ORIF, open reduction and internal fixation. Or we can also go for percutaneous KY stabilization. So these are the uh, different points. See this? See this uh, you know, schematic diagram, very useful for us. So here is the fracture, Bennett fracture dislocation. There are two K wires. These are called percutaneous K wire. Uh, you don't need to open the fracture side for this. Okay, there is a single K wire, which is enough. And the screw is also kept here. So different types of management. So we are uh, towards the end of this big topic. Okay, forearm and wrist fractures. One of the important part is called mallet finger. Okay, some of the questions may come in your exam. So let me cover this also. Mallet finger is a finger deformity caused by disruption of the terminal extensor tendon distal to the DIP joint. DIP is distal interphalangeal joint. That's the you know appearance of the mallet finger. Now see see this picture very carefully. You get a lot of uh, you know knowledge right from the picture itself. The extensor tendon, okay, especially the extensor digitorum, okay, uh, is uh, attached on this area, okay, the the base of the distal phalanx. If that extensor digitorum tendon is damaged, then the finger will develop this flexion type of deformity because the flexor uh, digitorum profundus tendon is still intact. So it is acutely flexing the finger. This type of appearance is known as mallet finger. Okay, so it is quite uh, clear now that so there is a damage of extensor tendon. The disruption may be bony or tendinous. Regarding the mechanism of mallet finger, there may be traumatic impaction blow, okay? Traumatic impaction blow to that area 
and another one the traumatic impaction blow forces the DIP joint into forced flexion by severely damaging the distal interphalangeal joint as well. Another uh, mechanism is the dorsal laceration. There is a cut or severe injury to the tendon. Okay, if the tendon is cut on the you know a dorsal aspect, then the function of that tendon is lost. Now look at this picture here. There is a flexion deformity of distal interphalangeal joint due to injury of extensor digitorum tendon often with a chip of the bone there. So there's a small fracture as well. Okay, this is known as avulsion fracture. A chip of the bone is, you know, taken forcibly out, avulsion fracture. See this, this is extensor tendon disruption. Okay, the tendon which is present here is known as extensor digitorum. And do you know which, which nerve is supplying extensor digitorum? Which nerve? Radial. Excellent. This is radial nerve. Why, why you say radial nerve? Why not median nerve? How, how we remember that? Sir, it's extensive group of. Extension group of. Extension group of. Posterior compound. Compound. Supply by red. Posterior compound of the hand is supplied by radial nerve. Very good answer. Excellent. All the students are giving correct answers because the extensor group or the posterior compartment of the forearm is the territory of radial nerve. So radial nerve is uh, responsible for this. Okay, very nice. So see that this is how we need to keep on revising the other aspect as well. Now, how to treat mallet finger? Non-operative treatment and operative treatment, both can be done. Regarding the non-operative one, we need to use the extension splinting of DIP joint for six to eight week. This is just a splint, just like this, see there? This is the splint. Just keep that joint straight. Don't allow that joint to flex. Surgical reconstruction of the tendon can be done because tendon is damaged there. Okay, so we can go for reconstruction and ORIF can also be done, especially if the bone is fractured. So this is the discussion of mallet finger. Now, this is the last slide of uh, this important and long topic. What are the complications of wrist fracture? We have already done this in detail in, in the previous discussion. Okay, let's just list them here. The most common complication of wrist fractures are poor grip strength, stiffness of the wrist and radial shortening. These are common complication than other. Okay, stiffness of the wrist is very, very important complication there. And there is only one way to decrease the chance of stiffness, that is physiotherapy, physiotherapy, okay, and exercise. Distal radius fracture in individual less than 40 years of age are usually highly comminuted and are likely to require ORIF. Their bones are still stronger, so a greater amount of force is necessary to break that bone. So when greater force is there, then comminuted fracture are more likely. So you know that. So comminuted fracture are you know treated by mainly by the ORIF. And in the older people, okay, in the older people, their bone is already osteoporotic. The bone is already weaker. So even a lesser amount of energy or impact can break the bone. 80% of the people have normal function in six to 12 months. This is a long time. See that six to 12 months is a long time, okay? So wrist fracture needs to be you know, handled well with physiotherapy. Now, these are the early and late complication of wrist fractures, means around the wrist. So these are the early. Difficult reduction, plus minus loss of reduction, compartment syndrome, which is more common in forearm fractures rather than wrist fractures, but nevertheless, it can occur there also. Extensor polysis longest tendon rupture, acute carpal tunnel syndrome, okay? Carpal tunnel syndrome can occur. This is a uh, important, uh, you know, a condition which I am going to talk after I finish this. Finger swelling with venous block and complication of tight cast or splint. These all are early. 
there is nothing to explain there okay and regarding the late mal union and radial shortening very common painful wrist secondary to ulnar prominence this is because of poor reduction frozen shoulder you see this the frozen shoulder is the problem of shoulder joint but why this condition is causing frozen shoulder because of immobilization because of that constant position and the person has not even tried to move the upper limb so it can occur post traumatic arthritis can occur carpal tunnel syndrome can occur and reflex sympathetic dystrophy also known as sudex osteodystrophy can occur in wrist wrist fracture